2017, 2018 City Council meeting for the City of Wheat Ridge. Would you please stand and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Clerk, please call the roll. Zachary Urban. Present. Monica Duran. Here. Tim Fitzgerald. Here. Leah Dozeman. Here. Christy Davis. Here. George Pond. Present. Larry Matthews. Here. Um, and Mr. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, councilors, in your package, you have uh, City Council uh, meeting minutes for July 23rd, 2018, and study session notes of July 16, 2018. Are there any uh, amendments or corrections noted to those? Otherwise, we will let them stand approved as presented, which we will do. Um, we have a, a very nice present uh, proclamation and ceremony this evening. I want to turn this over to uh, Mr. Goff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, very um, excited and proud um, for this uh, presentation this evening. Um, and honored to introduce uh, Craig Koshin um, to do the presentation. He's the former um, Arvada City Manager, and he's currently Senior Advisor for the International City County Manage Management Association. So he's going to present the Trailblazer Award to Ms. Heather Geyer. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I also uh, had the uh, distinction of serving for Mr. Urban's father at the city of Arvada. <laughs> so <Wow>. there is, <laughs> and it, it was a privilege. It always was a privilege. Um, again, good evening. Uh, and uh, I've been introduced as a senior advisor for Colorado City Managers and uh, International City Managers Association. Uh, unfortunately, um, when most people, when people call me, generally speaking, it's too late. So it's uh, my privilege to uh, be able to be here tonight for this very special honor. This award was created to honor a professional who stands out and consistently leads, is in the forefront of improving the value of public service specifically city, town, and county management, and particularly through the promotion and celebration of diversity in executive management. I don't need to elaborate in much detail to this mayor and council, the extraordinary talent, skill set, dedication, and energy that Heather Geyer brings to her job, this profession, and to this community. You all and your manager Patrick are to be strongly commended in the most complimentary terms for permitting and creating a great environment and culture where Heather has been able to grow, work, and show what she's, been, what she's made of. And problematically now, other communities, specifically the city of North Glen, are going to benefit from your good works and from Heather's hard work on your behalf. Because we have some viewers and listeners and some audience tonight, I'd ask you to indulge me just a little bit longer to talk a little bit more about Heather. Um, more indication of who she is, what she has accomplished, both working for you and for, in the large, larger regional and professional community. Heather, as you know, is a member of the Wheat Ridge Optimist Club, and amongst many projects, she facilitated the partnership with the city to host your annual toy drive. She has also been one of the major actors behind the scenes in the success of many great events that you hold annually. She's also served as Assistant Director of the Columbine Girls State Program through the American Legion Auxiliary. This is a program that provides mock government experience for young women who recently completed their junior year in high school. Beyond the local community, she also sponsors four children 
through Compassion International, a child advocacy ministry that pairs individuals with children who live in poverty, a cause near and dear to her heart. Regionally and nationally, Heather has served or is serving in many several different capacities. She is vice president of the International City and County Management Association for the Mountain Plains region, and this is an august international body. As a co-founding member of the Colorado Women Leading Government, she has been an advocate for advancing women in our profession as a coach, mentor, and extraordinary model. She has served as host and a major fundraiser for the highly successful Recent, Al Re uh, Recent Alliance for Innovation Conference. She was named in 2016 in Chris Traeger's list of 100 local government influencers at the top. She was president of the Colorado Local Government Assistance Association and is a representative to the uh, Colorado City, Man City and County Managers Association for that group. And finally, and reflecting some serious irony, Heather was the originator and the energy behind having this pre prestigious award become part of the state's local government culture. It's been given twice. It doesn't have to be given every year, but it's be being given this year to Heather. So I am very, very pleased and proud. It's my privilege to bring Heather up here and in front of you present this recognition as our state's trailblazer for 2017 and 2018. <laughs> Just keeping the overhead down. <laughs> Thank you, Craig, for coming this evening and presenting this award to me. I'm very honored. Um, thank you to Patrick and the rest of staff here and to all of you. I'm, it's, it, it's quite a week this week in terms of transitioning from a place that I've called home for so many years to um, that next step in my career, which is to become a city manager. And, and that's a dream that I've had since 1999 when I discovered that there was such a thing called a city manager position when I interned at the city of Greenwood Village. I was a senior at the University of Denver and had decided I didn't want to live inside the Beltway. I had spent a summer interning on Capitol Hill and decided that wasn't for me. It wasn't, it wasn't a way to be close enough to the citizenry and really feel like I could make a difference. Um, I've been fortunate to do what I've done over the time I've been here and throughout my career because of great mentors like Patrick Goff, um, who I think is one of the best city managers that has served the city of Wheat Ridge. You guys are really lucky to have him. And he didn't pay me to say that. Um, also, Michelle Kivala, who's the town administrator of the town of Parker. Um, she was the my first boss as an intern. She took a chance on me. And I think so much about Diversity and inclusivity is about taking a chance on people, recognizing the value, their assets, what they can bring to an organization, and, and helping them grow and contribute. I think oftentimes we spend too much time focused on differences, and um, life is really short, and there's so much that can be accomplished. And so in 2011, when I had the opportunity to co-found Colorado Women Leading Government, little did I know that it would play such an instrumental and pivotal role in my career. But we're really focused on empowering and uh, inspiring women to take that next step. And if it wasn't for the support that I have 
in the leadership here at the city of Wheat Ridge, I may not have taken that next step when I got the phone call from the city of North Glen in June um, inviting me to come interview with their city council. For those of you who don't know the story, I interviewed with them two years ago in the spring of, December, in the spring of 2016, and I wasn't picked. I was, I guess you could say, the runner-up. And so um, this has been just a really tremendous opportunity that I think the stars have aligned. And um, I'm taking that step. And I know I have a great network of professionals through CCCMA to support me and be there along the way. Um, but I can't thank the city of Wheat Ridge enough for all that you have done for me, investing in me, allowing me to you know, be a resource to others. I, I spent part of my morning yesterday on a coaching call with a young professional in Northern Colorado who's trying to navigate her, her professional career and, and trying to decide what steps to take. And I, I'm very fulfilled and find great um, joy in being able to do that. Um, a couple last things I'll leave you with because I, I had made bullet points of all these statistics that I was gonna share with you guys. Um, so I'll share one. 19.8% of chief executive officers in local government are female. And um, certainly there's other corresponding statistics for females who serve in an elected capacity at the local level, state and federal level. And I think we can do better than that. Um, at the end of the day, I think about my 16 year old niece who wants to be a doctor and she wants to help deliver babies in third world countries. And I think about my nine-year-old niece who wants to be a teacher and her bedroom becomes her classroom and, and that's what she does when she plays. And so I wanna challenge each and every one of you to think about what you can do to help empower and inspire women in your life to make sure that they get to choose who they wanna be when they grow up, I was fortunate to be raised by a mother who said, you can do anything you wanna do, you just have to work really hard at it. So I want the future to be such that my niece, my nieces and the other young women in the world aren't discriminated against in the way that many women are today and that they can sit at the table and they can contribute and they can play a role in making the world a better place. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we have one other presentation. Uh, Ms. Dozman, if you'd join me at the podium. Hi, Craig. Good to see you. Good evening. Tonight I am on this side of the dais and I am presenting the 49th annual Wheat Ridge Carnation Festival plate to the city of Wheat Ridge. I have served on the Carnation Festival board for the last four years. Uh, for the last three I've actually uh, been parade chair and this uh, was, as you can see on the wall behind you, we have plates from most every year of the Carnation Festival dated back to the very beginning in 1969. Uh, two years ago, I had a member of the committee choose to do a uh, plate design contest. So we have been soliciting artwork from local artists within the community. And they, we choose a winner, uh, of, have a panel of judges to choose a winner. And uh, this year, Wil Wilma Knees was the winner and it depicts a Roy's market in the 1920s. Her family uh, had a farm here in Wheat Ridge. And I'm here to thank all of the city councils and the mayors past and present for supporting the Carnation Festival for the, the last 49 years. And I would like to present this to Mayor Bud Starker this evening. And I would like to thank city staff, public works, Wheat Ridge Police Department, Parks and Rec for helping us put this festival on each and every year. It's, it takes 
tremendous amounts of resources. The police department stays at the, far, at the park for 24 seven. Um, public works magically and Parks and Rec magically put everything together and then go clean up as if a festival weren't there 24 to 48 hours later. And so I just wanna thank all of you for coming out and enjoying the festival and for helping it be such a success each and every year. Well, Lee, I'm honored to accept this on behalf of the city, and I would like to uh, recognize the festival chairman, uh, Joe DeMott, vice chair, Walt Pettit, and the parade chair, Leah Dozman. And uh, it, was a, it, was a great, it was a great festival, it was a great parade, and, uh, and I want to thank the, the work that the city put into it and all the citizens and people in the surrounding communities that came out to, uh, to have a great time at the, at the uh, Carnation Festival. And we'll be back next year with number 50. So thank you. Okay, our next item uh, on the agenda is the um, uh, second opportunity for public input uh, concerning the 2019 budget. Um, do we have anybody here that would like to speak on that item? Okay. If I could, uh, on, an, on another related note, if you would please silence your telephones, that will help us out in the, uh, in the meeting hall. Um, all right, we will go now to Citizens' Right to Speak. Um, I have a, a sign-up list here. And I assume these are item on uh, items that are not on the agenda. So this is a general uh, right to speak. When I call, please come to the podium, adjust the mic, give us your name first and last, if you'd spell your last name, and give us your address. And you have uh, three minutes. So our first um, speaker is David Ellenberger and Dominic Breton on deck. My name is David Ellenberger. Last name is E L L E N B E R G E R. Been a, had the fortune, good fortune to be a citizen of Wheat Ridge for the past seven years. So, um, first time appearing in front of you all, but thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, I talked with uh, Councilwoman Duran this morning about a very important issue that's coming up in Congress. Actually, a very good segue from the Carnation Festival. Um, many people probably don't know that Anderson Park and the pool associated with it uh, were bought through a helped being purchased through a government program called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's actually a fund um, that's been in existence since 1964. It helped, it's uh, funded by offshore oil development and um, royalties and revenue from, from those explorations. And the idea behind it was if we're going to disturb a, a sensitive, beautiful area on our coasts, we should um, promote onshore resources for our communities, our states, um, and the federal um, government to help promote access to public lands, promoting new, new access, all the way down to things like tennis courts and swimming pools for communities. Uh, many of you will be surprised to know that uh, over those five decades, uh, Jefferson County has received over 80 um, uh, distributions from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And it's just been a good idea that's been very bipartisan and it's, it's just worked for our country. Um, Colorado uh, has received over $268 million from the fund. Uh, but the big threat to the fund is that it's um, expiring at the end of September. And so I have taken the liberty to draft a resolution, to, starting with my community, um, to support the uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund. And I have little packets for you all that you can pass around um, that include a little fact sheet on how the fund has worked for Colorado over those past five decades, a sample resolution that I wrote, and um, a letter from Governor Hickenlooper to our congressional delegation uh, promoting both full funding. It can be funded at $900 million a year, although that's only happened twice in the history of the fund. Uh, the funds have often been diverted elsewhere for other government purposes, but uh, we would like to see full funding and reauthorization by September 30th. So that's, that's what this um, resolution I'll put before you speaks about. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dominic Breton and uh, Evan Clark on deck. All right, I'm Dominic Breton, B-R-E-T-O-N. 
3645 Marshall Street, Reed Ridge, Colorado. So I am here tonight to talk to you about, we had a great weekend here in Reed Ridge. I want to thank everybody for coming out to the 49th Annual Carnation Festival. Um, we could not have done it without the Reed Ridge PD. We had great support from them, from Parks and Rec, and from the city and all the community citizens. It is such an honor to be on that board. I've been on it for over two years, and the Carnation Festival fully supports everybody in the community. We have already raised over $2,232 for the silent student bench auction. We still have five benches to give out and collect for. It benefits all the schools in Reed Ridge. It benefits everybody straight across the board, from the elementary school to the high school to all the service clubs. I am so happy that the city supports this and so many people come out and help us with it. And then also I wanted to take a real quick second. I got in the mail the other day the Reed Ridge Kiwanis. Instead of asking for money, they sent me a thank you letter saying we've been in the city for 60 years. So we are going to be capitalizing on that, and we want to invite the city to get involved and come and learn about what the Kiwanis do, citizens and the city. We're having an open house Thursday morning, 7 to 8. Let us buy you breakfast, and I want to thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Evan Clark and John Clark on deck. So my name is Evan Clark, C-L-A-R-K. I live on 4665 Swadley Street. And uh, for the past five da days, we've been at the Jefferson County Fair and Festival. Um, it's been a rough past day because uh, yesterday was auction day and we had to say goodbye to all of our livestock. Um, but Council Member Urban and Mayor Starker came out and um, had fun um, at the Celebrity Livestock Show, which I got the opportunity to judge. And I just want to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, it was really fun watching you guys show pigs. And just to let everyone know, pigs are the hardest to show because you have to walk, walk them with a stick. Um, and I appreciate everyone else uh, giving support to the Jefferson County Fair and Festival. And I'd like to thank you all for your time. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. And I want to, Mr. Uh, Urban and I shared a, shared a comment that if our uh, council was as cooperative as our, our swine that we'd really be able to accomplish quite a bit. <laughs> Mr. Clark. And I can attest to that because I was there. Um, John Clark, 4665 Swadley Street. Um, I'll piggyback on what my son said, um, but I want to touch on the festival real quick. I had the opportunity to serve pancakes over at the uh, Grange Hall with Dominic. Um, about started about 6.30, which was a little early with five days of fair. But uh, I was there. Um, uh, Council Member Urban was there. I think he came through the line twice. <laughs> Ms. Dozman was there, thank you. Um, the mayor was there, appreciate that. I think uh, that's a great starter for, for a great parade. I came down today thinking that Ms. Dozman was going to hand me a plate for the 4-H for the float, but I <laughs> don't see any plates back here, so I guess we didn't win. But that's okay. But through five days of fair, um, I think the two that came out can probably attest to how hard these kids work. And the parents are right there the whole time. I was able to watch the parade um, from the front of my business. I enjoyed it immensely. 80-some um, entries, I believe. We went down. I was able to go down. The kids and, uh, and Mama was over at the uh, Jeffco Fairgrounds. I was able to go down to the festival and try to support some of those service organizations, support the Optimus Club and, and check out the, the high school high school kids. Um, I bid on a bench, and one of those benches you're talking about that hasn't been paid for, that's one of mine. <laughs> so I'll come by and pay for it. Um, but that's a great program. Um, but I w I, and that plate, I didn't know that that plate had that, uh, that artwork on it. And I would like to say that the, the quote that you have on there, her fa or the quote that you had, her family had a farm in Weaver, which I think that's great. And I think that the farming roots in Weaver, which I think we really need to celebrate. So I would, I would like to say thank you to both you guys. You guys did a very good job. Um, 
when you take guys like this out of their element <laughs> and and put them in a show ring with seven, eight other people driving pigs to a judge, four judges actually. Um, my son is on the judging team, so he uh, got the opportunity to judge them. You take guys like that out of their element, it's fun to watch. It really is, and I hope you, <laughs> I hope you guys had fun. So I know my son won't say it, but they had a great fair. Um, Evan won a few buckles. He was uh, he got a grand champion, and I had to write these down because I can't remember them. Uh, intermediate beef showmanship. He was a grand champion. Um, he had the grand champion market goat, and he had the grand champion breeding goat. And my oldest son, Ian, who's not here, couldn't make it tonight, was uh, he had the grand champion breeding rabbit with his meat pen that all three rabbits came within two ounces of each other. He had the best of show in rabbit, and he also won grand champion in senior goat showmanship. So I know these both of these run on the same weekend, and it's very, very tough to try to make both. I appreciate you guys coming out and, and making that effort. So thanks, guys. Thank you. That is all of the um, people that I have signed up on our sign-up sheet. If there is anyone else that would like to speak under public comment, you may do so. Uh, now would be the time if you'd like to come forward. I don't see anyone, so we will um, conclude our public comment. Oh, please come, come forward, sir. Come, come and get into the microphone, adjust the microphone, tell us your name and spell your last name and tell it. But uh, Lee H. Cantu, it's a well-known name here in Colorado, or it was. Now we're city slickers. Most of us have moved into the city. But I'm, I'm kind of uh, dumbfounded about how Widridge runs things. ADU is one of them. The ADU is, has something to do with housing for the people of this district, right? I, wa I want to find out if you can tell me something more about it, because I'm a little confused about what it says in this paper. How you can qualify for housing and all that. There's too many people coming here to Denver, Colorado as a whole. So can you answer me some of that? Well, uh, maybe not right away. You know, not right away. What I would suggest is that you get in touch with, uh, with Mr. Goff and, uh, and he will be able to uh, direct you to the most appropriate uh, agency or person in our, in our city that would be able to give you more detailed information. Okay, now, I have been a resident of uh, Thornton, Denver, and Golden over the years. Now I'm over here in Quidridge, but, and I'm a member of the National Parks, and uh, I want to find out more about the parks of the city the way they're operated, because now we've got people from all over the countries in the states living here. And it's more, happening more and more every, every single day, every week. So we have more accidents as a whole. So that's why I'm here to study the review with you gentlemen here and, and the miss over there, Mr. Duran. And, and I don't know all of you as a whole, and you don't know me. So I want to get there, you know, kind of uh, touch base with all of this. All right. Well, thank you very much. We have a wonderful Parks Department, and, and uh, Mr. Goff can direct you on how to get some more information on that also. That's yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there anyone else uh, here tonight who would like to come forth and speak on public comment? Mr. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. Did you get... Is he, he's not signed up? He is not. Uh, we may, perhaps Mr. Goff could get his uh, name. He'll get his name and, and address for us. Thank you. Okay. We're going to turn the page and go to uh, agenda item number one. This is the consent agenda item. Ms. Dozman, would you please introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Consent agenda item 1A, motion to approve payment to Kaiser Permanente for August 2018 membership billing in the amount of $191,451.47 and September membership billing in the amount of $202,189.30.
Consent Agenda Item 1B, Resolution 42-2018, approving a memorandum of understanding between the Wheat Ridge Police Department, the Golden Police Department, and the First Judicial District Attorney's Office for the establishment of a body-worn camera program. Thank you. Is, uh, is, uh, does anyone on council wish to take any of these off of the consent agenda? All right, we will consider them as a package. Please uh, give us a motion on that. I move to approve consent agenda items 1A and 1B. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, please poll the council. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Um, Ms. Davis, would you please introduce item number two? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Bill number 22-2018, an ordinance creating a new section 26-643 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws prohibiting the use of freestanding emergency room facilities. This ordinance revises the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to prohibit freestanding emergency room facilities throughout the city. Um, this is a public hearing um, on second reading. Uh, thank you. Um, this is an ordinance on second reading. Uh, it is not quasi-judicial, but it is a public hearing. Uh, do we have an ordinance number for this? This will be ordinance number 1646. I would like to open the public hearing at this time. Um, and. Uh, Go to Mr. Goff for a yeah, uh, Mr. Gall, our city attorney will have a, a, a brief um, uh, presentation. Uh, as council is aware, uh, we've uh, seen this uh, issue a number of times over the years, and council uh, most recently directed uh, that there be a moratorium on freestanding uh, emergency room facilities, and that moratorium is expiring, and uh, the council directed that this ordinance be brought forward. The key to the ordinance is the definition, really, defining what a freestanding emergency room facility is, and then you'll notice uh, not permitting that, uh, that uh, use in, the, in the, the, uh, the various zone districts in the city. Uh, and so that, that's, that's how uh, the, the prohibition actually, uh, actually works. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, before we go to questions uh, from council, I would like to open this up for public comment. I do not have anyone signed up to speak on this issue. Is there anyone here who would like to come forth and speak on this? All right, we'll, I see none. We will close the public comment section. I, I said that there is, uh, the public is invited to speak on this issue if anyone wishes to speak on this issue. They could, well, this is, this is uh, item number two on the agenda. And so I will um, open it up to questions from council. Mr. Matthews. Do we have a, a definition for urgent care facilities? I guess we're differentiating between the two here, kind of. I don't believe we do. I can look in the code while. No, we don't. We don't. We don't. I, I'm just concerned if there might be some confusion there, but I, I'll, I'll leave that to the legal educated guys to figure out. Additional discussion? Uh, is there any, um, before I close the public hearing and ask for a motion, is there any other questions that uh, we'd like to make of staff? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and a motion is in order. Thank you. I move to approve Council Bill number 22-2018, an ordinance creating a new section 26-643 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws prohibiting the use of freestanding emergency room facilities on second reading and that it take effect immediately upon Council adoption. Second. We have a, a motion on uh, and a second on item number two. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. We will move to item number three. Ms. Dozman, would you please introduce item number three? Yes, hold on just a sec. So Council Bill number 19-2018, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 4288 Youngfield Street from Neighborhood Commercial to Mixed Use Neighborhood, case number WZ-18-12 slash Copper Forest. 
At issue, the applicant is requesting approval of a zone change from neighborhood commercial to mixed use for property located at 4288 Youngfield Street. The proposed rezoning area includes one parcel, the total size of which is approximately 1.38 acres. Thank you. Um, this is a, an ordinance on second reading. It is a uh, quasi-judicial public hearing. Uh, what is the ordinance number for this? Mr. Mayor, this ordinance will be number 1650. I'm going to open the public hearing, and before we, before we swear everybody in, I'd like to, uh, to make uh, everyone aware that public hearings, quasi-judicial public hearings, are for the purpose of um, considering ch zone change requests, which are property rights in our state. Um, the, uh, the council is, uh, is, is sitting as a, as a, a, a quasi-judicial tribunal. They are not legislators in this, in this matter. They are, they are um, quasi-judicial. Uh, they they've been um, sequestered in a sense not to speak to anyone else about the matters in this, uh, before us in this hearing. Um, and I want to caution the, um, b because all of the, all of the testimony that they're going to hear is part of the record and that's what they're going to make their decision on is the evidence and the, and the facts that are presented. And I want to caution the audience not to, not to have any outbursts. There's no cheering, there's no booing, there's, you need to sit there and be quiet because your role is not to influence any of these, any of these, uh, uh, jurists, if you will. So I really appreciate you, you being courteous and, and taking that to heart. Um, so that we don't have to, um, to have any outbursts. So anyway, thank you very much for that. Uh, if you intend to um, give testimony in this matter, would you please stand, and I have a little oath that I'd like to uh, have you swear to. So if you intend to come up and give testimony under this matter, please stand and raise your hand. Raise your right hand. And uh, uh, let's see. Do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth as you understand it in this matter? If so, say, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation? We do. Uh, Mr. Zach Wallace Mendez from Community Development will provide the presentation. Mr. Mendez. Good evening. For the record, Zach Wallace Mendez. I'm a planner with the Community Development Department. Uh, presenting case number WZ1812, request for approval of a zone change from neighborhood commercial to mixed use neighborhood on property located at 4288 Youngfield Street. Uh, I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. The property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met and therefore city council does have jurisdiction to hear the case. We'll start with the 2016 aerial. Uh, the property is located on the northwest corner of Youngfield and 42nd Avenue. Um, as you can see, it's directly east of the um, I-70 Highway 58 interchange. Uh, the zoning in the area is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, to the south is Commercial One, uh, an irrigation supply company operates out of there with a special use permit. To the east is restricted commercial, um, two properties owned restricted commercial. One is the Jefferson County Head Start School, and then the other is a specialty retail um, store. Uh, there, the darker green to the northeast uh, is uh, agricultural two, mostly single family homes, um, some semi-agricultural properties. There are two dog, dog kennels, excuse me, that operate in this area uh, under special use permits. And then the highways and the green belt are zoned agricultural one, as are a few uh, properties in the periphery. And just to kind of uh, jog everyone's memory, I'm sure we all know this building um, on Youngfield. It was originally built in 2001 as a model home for a log uh, home builder. The current owner purchased the property in 2015 and converted it into a series of small offices, which it continues to operate as today. Every zone change request does require a neighborhood meeting. Uh, the meeting for this request was held on May 2nd with three neighbors in attendance. Summary notes can be found in your packet, but the major concerns raised during that meeting um, were proximity to the Head Start School as the, uh, the property owner does intend to uh, operate a, a wine and beer bar out of this establishment. So there were concerns raised about the proximity of that specific use to the Head Start. 
Um, and there were also general concerns about traffic in the area and, and what this, what a rezoning and a potential future change of use um, may, what impacts that may have. Um, staff has not received any calls or letters during the public posting period for this public hearing, uh, nor the, the uh, Planning Commission public hearing. During the referral period to outside agencies and city departments, the Jefferson County Head Start did submit uh, a letter stating they're concerned over the proposed use of the property. Um, and no other concerns were raised from any other utility districts or city departments. As the commissioners are aware, or um, excuse me, the council, city council is aware, uh, we use several criteria to evaluate a zone change requests. Primary among them is consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, the, the general location of the subject property is that little turquoise star, um, and then the yellow brownish color underneath that represents a uh, neighborhood buffer. Uh, the comprehensive plan states this area uh, should function as a buffer between low intensity residential areas and higher intensity commercial corridors and uses. The subject property um, has low scale commercial uses to the east as well as low scale um, low intensity residential uses and then a pretty high intensity uh, Youngfield Street and I-70 to the, to the west, um, not necessarily commercial but still very high intensity. Um, as such, uh, staff finds that the permitted uses under the mixed use neighborhood zone district are, are in line or less intensive than the, the uses permitted by the adjacent C1 and RC zone districts. Uh, additionally, if the property were to redevelop in the future, the MUN development standards uh, provide an adequate buffer from that high intensity I-70 Youngfield corridor to the lower intensity commercial and residential uses to the east. Um, so as such, staff concludes that the proposed MUN zoning is consistency with those goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan and that neighborhood buffer designation. I want to go back to the zoning map quickly um, just to put into context why mixed-use neighborhood is being proposed on this property. Um, the adjacent properties are zoned restricted commercial and commercial one. Um, the code does not currently allow rezonings to any straight commercial zone district. So um, that's why you never see any rezonings to C1 or RC or NC. Um, the code does not allow that. Any rezoning to a commercial use must be in a planned development or to the industrial employment um, district, which is uh, obviously a lot more industrial than, than uh, this particular uh, location can support. Uh, additionally, the purpose of a planned development is to per permit the establishment of well-designed, innovative developments that may not be feasible under a standard zone district. Um, so staff finds that that also doesn't apply to this property. Um, it, having a planned development here will not result in an innovative development as the applicant does not wish to redevelop the property. Um, nor does the property exhibit any unique circumstances such as topographical challenges or unique shape um, that would prevent the property from feasibly being used under a, a straight zone district or a standard zone district such as our mixed use districts or um, the, the neighborhood commercial that currently exists on it. So um, since a planned development, it doesn't meet the, the standards for a, a planned development. Um, industrial is not uh, an appropriate use in this location. Then we are looking at our, our mixed use zone districts. Um, as the council is aware, there is a wide range of those mixed use districts. Uh, due to the, the proximity to I-70, the mixed use commercial interstate district um, could have been appropriate, as could the mixed use commercial district due to its location on a heavy arterial such as Youngfield. Um, however, staff uh, worked with the applicant and landed on the mixed use neighborhood as it serves as more of a buffer between the Youngfield I-70 interchange and those lower intensity uses to uh, the east. Um, under the mixed use commercial and mixed use commercial interstate, um, a lot more heavy uses could be allowed um, as well as kind of a less, it's, it's, those are less of a transitional district um, as, as the MUN is. The MUN uh, has height standards and development standards that are more in line um, with kind of a buffering to those lower intensity uses. So with all that said, um, that is why a mixed use neighborhood is the proposed zone district tonight as opposed to a planned development or some other zone district. So with all of that, uh, staff has concluded that the request does meet the zone change criteria. The zone change is supported by the comprehensive plan uh, and the mixed use neighborhood zoning is a compatible buffer between the high density or excuse me, high intensity freeway uh, and the low intensity commercial and residential development to the east. Uh, for those reasons, staff recommends approval. 
Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. That's the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, the applicant is present, but does not, not wish to make a presentation, but she can answer any questions that may be better suited for her than, than staff. Thank you very much. Um, before we go to questions from, uh, from council, I would like to uh, invite the public to uh, weigh in on this issue. Uh, and I have a sign-up sheet with several people signed up. Our first uh, speaker would be Gail Perriman and Anne Gladfelter on deck. So if you'd like to please come to the podium and adjust the microphone and give us your first name and last name and spell your last name. My name is Gail Perryman, P-E-R-R-Y-M-A-N, and I'm the director for Jefferson County Head Start. Oh, and I, give us your address also. Oh, 5150 Allison Street, Arvada, 8002. Thank you. So for over 11 years, we've had this building as our Head Start building, um, and we are a grant that is operated through the um, Jefferson County and our Board of County Commissioners are our board. And we feel very strongly that this is an inappropriate establishment to be put next door to a Head Start building. Um, if this rezoning goes through, we know we're subject to whoever moves in or um, whatever uh, liquor establishment comes into that building. Um, we want the council to please remember that we, we work hard to help very vulnerable Wheat Ridge families that live in poverty um, within, um, and this, this establishment is going to be a constant uh, concern for our staff and our vulnerable families. So we're asking for you to keep that in mind. They have talked about a fence, but we also um, are concerned about our parking lot. We're concerned about uh, just the, the location in general, that it is completely inappropriate um, for, our, for the work that we do with vulnerable families, and we're trying to serve Wheat Ridge. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Ann uh, Gladfelter and Mary Ellen Barton on deck. My name is Ann Gladfelter, 12725 West 42nd Avenue, Wheat Ridge, and that's the address of Head Start. I'm a teacher at Head Start, and our children are three to five years old, and they come um, all five days of the week, and in the wintertime, it's dark when they when we leave and what, sometimes when they leave and we have meetings at night. I'm very concerned about safety. I'm concerned about traffic and the road and it's very dark on that street and I'm concerned about the lighting and so to have a lot of more cars in that area um, just makes me feel scared for the children and for our safety and for the um, families. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mary Ellen Barton and Lee Canta on deck. And thank you for allowing me to speak. It's Mary Eileen Barton. I'm sorry. And I'm in the same address. I think it's 12427 West 42nd Street in Wheat Ridge. And I'm a Head Start teacher as well. And my big concern um, is I can't think of any other instance where I've seen an establishment of this type next to a school. And I've lived in a lot of states. I've lived in seven states. and and the country of Germany, and I don't think that I've ever seen a school this close to an establishment of this type. So for me, it's just a public health concern and obviously concern for my families and the children that I teach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Lee Canta and Rex Winters on deck. Please come to the. Okay. Okay. Are you? Okay. Are, are you Mr. Canta? Okay, Mr. Canta. Thank you very much. You have signed up to speak, uh, either uh, to give your opinions on item number three, which is a rezoning application for a property um, located on Youngfield Boulevard. Do you, have any, do you have any testimony or anything that you'd like to say in this regard? No, what I'm interested in is getting some of the trees that are overhanging over the streets. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. That would be, that, this wouldn't be the appropriate time to go into that. So, okay. 
well, this isn't the time to sort of go into the trees and the arborists, but, uh, uh, you know, we will. Yeah, I'm a little careful that the leaf running hadn't been, so, you know, I'm still studying. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Rex Winters. Thank you very much. I'm here to represent my wife and a neighbor across the street. We live on, uh, my name is Rex Winters, W-I-N-T-E-R-S, address 12310 West 42nd Avenue. Thank you. The neighbor I'm representing is Greg Boom, directly across the street from us at 4225 Vivian Street. We are concerned, my wife is particularly concerned, that this, uh, we've been told that this establishment is involved with alcohol, and we don't believe that an establishment of that type should be contiguous with a Head Start school, children three to five years old. So uh, we'd like to register that as something to think about. Secondly, there's the concern about a small neighborhood, the streets are narrow, and there could be a lot of congestion in the afternoon hours when parents are picking up their children from, from the Head Start School. Uh, we think it would be more appropriate to, us, to move this establishment across I-70 to the Clear Creek Crossing area where there are going to be commercial businesses and a lot more open roads uh, access. And it would remove the danger of any alcohol influence on the Head Start School. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all of the people, uh, uh, the citizens that I have signed up on my list. Is there anyone here in the audience who would like to, uh, also would like to speak on this? And I don't see anyone. Uh, so now I'm going to open it up for questions from council of the, uh, of staff. Mr. Pond. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> question, a couple questions for staff. Um, first would be, uh, just to be clear, we're not, uh, we're not adjudicating on a liquor license this evening, and, and if I'm correct on that, um, you, you perhaps could let us know a little bit about the process um, for a liquor license, but just to confirm, we're not approving a liquor license this evening. That, that's correct. Uh, the liquor licenses are granted exclusively by the Liquor Licensing Authority. Uh, so what you're uh, reviewing is a zone change that would allow a range of uses. And of course, no question, they've indicated what their intention is. And it would, it would allow a liquor establishment, only, but only if that establishment went ahead and, and, and got a, a liquor license from a liquor licensing authority. If the licensing authority doesn't grant a liquor license, the rezoning remains, but, but uh, they, they'd have to use one of the other uses that's uh, permitted by the zone district that they're rezoning to. Right, so to be specific, we're adjudicating a request for a zone change from neighborhood commercial to mixed, to mixed use neighborhood. And, and the liquor issue is really a, is not, a, a, is not a, a part of that criteria or consideration. That's correct, it's okay. the liquor license is not, not in front of you. Oh, okay. And then my second question was perhaps just for a little bit more clarity at, because I've served on the Planning Commission and I think I, I know it, but I, it would be a good refresher. You've used the term buffer um, specifically as related to the mixed-use neighborhood um, zoning. As I understand that, there's very specific buffering criteria for adjacency to neighborhood, residential, et cetera, that, that has to do with height and some other things. Could you explain that a little bit more and how that differs from the other, from the other mixed use opportunities like in, interstate or commercial in this case? Uh, so the specific buffers are similar between those, all those districts. Um, I think it's a six foot landscaped buffer um, adjacent to residential uses. 
Um, I guess the buffer that I was more talking about was just the, the development standards that are built into the code. Um, the mixed use neighborhood is limited to 35 feet if there is a, a residential component and then 50 feet if there's a commercial component. Um, I don't believe that the mixed use commercial and mixed use commercial interstate have those restrictions. Can you verify? Right. Correct. Yeah, so um, potentially something much taller could go there. Um, so the specific buffers um, in terms of landscape buffers adjacent to residential uses are the same between those districts, um, but the development standards differ between those. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Matthews. Um, can someone please tell me about the codes? I thought we had some restrictions here for setting up schools next to alcohol serving places. Could someone tell me what the, the, the uh, distance limitations are in the codes a little bit? Certainly, that's, that's a pertinent question. Uh, our code requires that there be a 500 foot setback from public or parochial schools to liquor establishments, but as permitted by uh, the state statute, the code has been amended to eliminate that distance requirement for a, a certain list of subset list of liquor licenses and those are um, hotel and restaurant licenses beer and wine licenses brew pub <clears throat> arts licenses and vintners restaurant licenses so you can have one of those licenses and uh, not comply with and, and be right next to a school the 500 foot limit doesn't apply by virtue of the city's code the state legislature has allowed cities locally to eliminate that distance restriction uh, for those kinds of uses and I'm trying to think when this was done it was done in it looks like 2012 uh, the city council did so but our our current co city codes prohibited no what I'm saying I'm reading from the current city code this okay the the, the 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 current city code says the 500 foot restriction applies except for this list of liquor licenses where it doesn't apply. Okay, thank you. Yep. Now I had a, another question on this buffering concept. Um, maximum building height for neighborhood commercials 35. If we go MUN, they can put 50 feet in. Maximum lot coverage can go to 90% from 80%. Minimum landscaping can go from 20% to 10 percent and um, I'm not seeing how that really creates a buffer if we build a mountain next to a molehill and we have no guarantees once we rezone this, pro this, this uh, property of what's really going to go in there and, and so we could have a five-foot square building in there five feet from property lines or whatever or zero feet from property lines there's just no controls is that correct? Uh, there are residential transitions. Um, so as you as you go up in height, so from one to two stories, there's a setback in a landscape buffer of 10 feet. A three-story building has a, has a setback in a landscape buffer of 15 feet. And then a four-story building or higher has a setback landscape buffer of 20 feet. Um, and there's also upper story setbacks. So for each story that you um, go up, there's a five-foot step back, step, step back, excuse me, per story. Um, so yes, it could potentially cover more of the lot, um, as you mentioned, and the landscaping could reduce from the current NC, um, but there are step back landscape buffers and things like that, um, as well as in the MUN as compared to the MUC and MUCI, um, less height is allowed overall. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rand. Thank you. Can you tell me what the distance is between um, this proposed development and Head Start School that's there? What's the it's, distance? It's, uh, it's next door. so Like 10 feet, 20 feet? The, the parcels, are they share a lot line, so they're right next to each other. The buildings are about 200 feet apart. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, Zach, is it my understanding that uh, there will be very little overlap in time between when the uh, bar is open and when the uh, school is in session? Um, I might refer that to the applicant. I know I did mention um, what she had proposed in the staff report, but I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, so maybe I'd let her answer that instead of shuffling through all the papers to try to find that. 
she... Would you like the applicant to come forward and, and yeah. speak on that? And let me just verify, I believe you were, you, you, you got sworn in when you needed to, correct? Yes, Please proceed. Give us your name. and Karen. It's M-C-E-A-H-E-R-N and uh, 4288 Youngfield Street. So um, I, I don't know if I'm able to go really quickly when you're talking about the public next to the, the alcohol uh, source. Um, the Head Start is actually labeled as private. And then I, I don't, I'm not a... Um, I haven't studied any of this, but I've read up about it, and you can probably explain a little bit better. I believe it's a, um, like, uh, liquor cannot be next to public first through 12th grade. And so this is a, I'm not sure if it's a, I think it's a daycare center. It is used for Head Start, so they do teach the kids, but it is private, and so that was the difference. And then really quickly, what we're looking to do is a wine and beer tap house within the cabin. We wanna keep that structure. Um, that's my husband's baby. He absolutely loves that cabin. And so we're trying to find ways so that it, we don't sell the property and it gets torn down. And instead we keep it, maintain the, you know, the neighborhood feel and uh, have an establishment, which we, we think, we hope, uh, will be conducive to uh, just a neighborhood atmosphere, a friendly atmosphere, a gathering place afterwards. Well, what I'm asking is when do you plan to open for liquor sales or for 3 p.m.? 3 PM? following what other breweries in the area do, which is usually at 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. or 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Davis. So I have just a quick question. Can you enter the property? Is there a way to enter the property from Youngsfield? There is not, no. So it's just from that side street? Mm -hmm, just from 42nd. And then I, you know, I'm just looking um, back at the neighborhood commercial district, and it talks about that commercial land use. So, I mean, again, I mean, when there was discussions around traffic and we worry about the traffic, I mean, ultimately, it could be a big office building that could create just as much traffic, if not more, all day long, if it turned into a commercial office building. Mm -hmm, correct. Before I close the public hearing uh, and ask for motion and council discussion, does council have any other questions of the applicant or staff? Ms. Dozeman. I would like to know what time the Head Start closes. So if you could, did you say 5.30? Could someone from Head Start come forward and get, uh, let us know when Head Start closes? And the Um, Head Start uh, has a potential to close and end at 5.30 with parents picking up, but parents are often late at times, so we usually try to be out there by 5.45. Thank you. So is that normal business hours, though? That yes. yes. Okay, so 7 a.m. roughly to 5.30? About, seven, about 7.30, 7, 7.30 to about 5.45. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of staff of uh, Mr. Urban? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, going back to Councilmember Davis's question about access off of Youngsfield, my understanding was that um, it would be possible to request access from CDOT uh, for that access. And given that the property has a Youngsfield address, uh, it would be more appropriate to have access off of Youngsfield. But can you speak to the uh, ease or difficulty of getting that CDOT access or what the process would be to require that? Sure. Um, so CDOT has a two-step process whenever you're requesting what they call an access permit. Um, anybody could apply for an access permit. In our experience, it's unlikely that one would be granted when a local street access would be able to serve the same property. CDOT's really hesitant um, to provide an access when there's an alternative that's not off the state highway, particularly in a situation like this where there's a bend in the road and a heavily used intersection just to the north at 44th. So it could be applied for, but um, based on our experience, it would be unlikely to be granted with this fact pattern at this property. And are, are there any other CDOT access points along Youngsfield in adjacent properties, or is there any way to tell where previous access points have been granted? 
The closest access point um, in this vicinity would be at Storall, where they don't have a local street access option, just to the north. It's shaded in purple in the zoning map. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just for clarity in the record, uh, Youngfield is a state highway? Correct. Thank you. Ms. Dozman. What is the capacity and square footage of that building? Do you know that offhand? I, I don't offhand. Um, I'm sure it is in the staff report. Okay, or yeah, the applicant um, would be happy to take that. Oh, she said 5,000, sorry. I didn't, 5,000 square feet. 5,000. Thank you. So, 5,000 on the bottom, 2,500 on the main floor, and then there's a 500 foot loft. So, how many people would you say could be in your establishment at one point in time? We're, I haven't gone completely to the end simply because there's a lot of steps to take and I want to make sure I complete each step before I continue. But we do know what we need to sell each day and that kind of stuff, but uh, I don't know per square footage how many people are allowed to be in there. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any other, uh, any other discussion before I close the public hearing? Mr. Mayor, uh, I just had a question of... Um, as Councilmember Pond pointed out, this is just a rezoning and that the liquor license would have to be yet granted by the um, liquor authority. And what if that doesn't happen? Then well, what if they aren't granted the license? Uh, you know, that's a hypothetical question. Yeah. That what if? But that we're here in a we're here in a zoning hearing and not a liquor hearing, so Take them one, one at a time. Okay. Mr. Matthews. That was part of what I was thinking about, by the way. Um, then we've gone to MUN. Are there any other zoning classifications that would allow their intended use without going to MUN? A, a plan development or the industrial employment zone district? Would those uses be more restrictive in land use area and, and density than MUN? No, so MUN is the most restrictive uh, zone district option that we have to rezone to. That would allow a commercial entitlement. A plan development, of course, uh, could create any, any series of um, restrictions on it. So that, that's also sort of a hypothetical because those are documents that create their own zoning. So in terms of the mixed use spectrum where there's four options and the industrial employment, this is the most restrictive option. Do you understand what I'm saying? Which allows the highest density of residential? Uh, there's not a density limitation in any of our commercial zone districts. Are you saying they can build residential in commercial districts or are they prohibited? In a mixed-use district, residential development is permitted. Right. And what's the density limitation for this lot for uh, MUN? This area is a part of the urban renewal area and is exempted from the charter's heightened density requirements relative to residential. Thank you. Are there any other um, questions for uh, staff or the applicant? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing and a motion is in order. I'm sorry. No, you could call me out by name if you needed to. <laughs> sorry. <Thank> you. <laughs> okay. Do you have it up? Sorry, I'm trying to find it in my packet. It's on page three of the packet. Yeah. I move to approve Council Bill Number 19-2018, an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 4288 Youngfield Street from Neighborhood Commercial NC to Mixed Use Neighborhood MUN on second reading and that it take effect 15 days after final publication for the following reasons. One, City Council has conducted a proper public hearing that meets all public notice requirements as required by Section 26-109 of the Code of Laws. The requested rezoning has been reviewed. Two, the requested rezoning has been reviewed by the Planning Commission, which has forwarded its recommendation of approval 
approval and three the requested rezoning has been found to comply with the criteria for review in section 26-112.e of the code of laws is there a second second we have a motion is second by mr pond is there discussion on the motion mr pond <clears throat> thank you thanks to the staff and applicant for putting everything together um, <clears throat> I'll be voting for approval on this on the basis <clears throat> of the zone change request <clears throat> and, and really trying to limit it to that. And my strong suggestion um, or request is that, that, that we all try to be looking at it in that lens. The, um, the liquor license has its own um, approval process. It has its own public process. and. and and uh, the, all of the things, or many of the things that have been have been stated, um, are and can be and should be adjudicated through that process. That's what it's that's what it's for. If I look at the criteria for change for, for the request for this change and and for approval of this change, it's it it is pretty specific. Um, and out of many options, this really is perhaps the most reasonable um, uh, pathway uh, to changing it. And frankly, um, uh, it's, it's one that we have worked hard on for, for many years creating in our, in our, in our zoning um, um, kind of catalog as, as to how to to uh, to accomplish our our comprehensive plan and 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 I'll, I'll I'll linger on that for a second, which is to say that the primary you know thing that we're trying the primary criteria here is is it compliant with our comp plan? It is absolutely uh, you know more 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 than absolutely it's 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 um, it really um, it is trying to create investment uh, activation in areas and using a zone change that will allow, as it was correctly pointed out in the staff report, a contemporary or a more contemporary um, set of uses um, and and you know and and even site planning. Um, options, although we may argue about that, um, I think it does create a more contemporary and more and more appropriate um, palette of things uh, to to move forward. So that's what we're adjudicating on tonight. We're not adjudicating on um, the sales of, of wine or liquor, although you know that has been brought up and perhaps will be brought up as a as a secondary step. But if I am to strip away that and to look strictly at is there a reason? Is there a reason to uh, to approve a change from neighborhood commercial to mixed use neighborhood? And is it compliant and, and with our with our comp plan? And do I think that the criteria have been met, which is the bar that we're adjudicating on? The answer, in my mind, is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, additional um, discussion on the motion. Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? Um, the vote is four to three, which would mean that that fails. Yes, uh, the charter requires that all ordinances pass by uh, five votes. So in this particular case, the ordinance uh, falls short by, uh, by one vote, even though the motion appears to pass. That doesn't get you the five votes required for passage of an ordinance as required by the charter. So the uh, the applicant uh, the application is therefore uh, denied. Thank you. That will conclude item number three. Uh, we will move now to uh, agenda item number four. Mr. Urban, would you introduce item number four? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Bill number 20-2018 an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 6701 West 44th Avenue from commercial one to mixed use neighborhood, MUN case number WZ-18-14, uh, Patricus. Sorry if I butchered that. Um, at issue, the applicant is requesting approval of a zone change from commercial one to mixed use neighborhood for property located at 60. 
6701 West 44th. The proposed rezoning area includes one parcel, total size of which is slightly less than a half acre at this time. The intent of the zone changes to allow the current tenant and insurance agent to live and work on the property. Thank you. This is an ordinance on second reading. Is it, it is a, a, a quasi-judicial and is a public hearing. Um, what is our ordinance number for this? This will be ordinance number 1651. 1651. Uh, I'm going to um, open the public hearing. If you intend to speak on this uh, uh, agenda item, will you please stand or raise your right hand and take an affirmation? Um, do you swear or affirm that, that to tell the truth um, as you understand it in this matter? If you do, please say I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Mr. Uh, Goff, do we have a staff presentation? We do. Uh, Mr. Zach Wallace Mendez, again. Mr. Wallace Mendez, please proceed. Alrighty. So, once again, for the record, Zach Wallace Mendez, planner with the Wheat Ridge Community Development Department. Um, this is case number WZ 1814, request for approval of a zone change from C1, Commercial 1, to mixed use neighborhood. I would like to enter into the record the public. Uh, enter into the public record, excuse me, the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. The property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification imposing requirements have been met, and therefore the city council does have jurisdiction to hear the case. As always, we'll start with the 2016 aerial. Um, the property is located parallel with Otis Street between Pierce and Newland um, on the north side of 44th Avenue. Now with the zoning map overlaid, um, the, the Darker pink color is commercial one, um, kind of our wide range commercial zone district. Um, along 44th Avenue is a variety of commercial zone districts, so restricted commercial in this orange. Um, there's a hint of neighborhood commercial in this light pink over here. Um, and then a mixed use neighborhood property that was rezoned, um, I wanna say back in 2013 perhaps. Once you move off of 44th Avenue, um, further north or south, um, it transitions into our residential zone district. So this green is residential two, and this yellow is residential three. Um, there's a, a fair mix of single family, duplex, and uh, multifamily pro properties within the area, and with, the, with the commercial activity being concentrated on 44th Avenue. This is the property. Um, the structure was constructed in 1910 as a single family home. It was zoned residential three up until 1982 uh, when it was rezoned by city council at that time to commercial one. Um, and then there's <coughs> building permits that converted it from a single family house into a commercial structure. Uh, the property is now currently being utilized as an insurance office and the applicant is requesting the rezoning to allow the structure to be used as a live work space which is currently not allowed under the C1 zone district, I should add. Um, all zone change requests require neighborhood meetings. This neighborhood meeting was on May 16th. Uh, no neighbors were in attendance. Uh, additionally, staff has not received any calls or letters during either of the public posting periods for uh, the public hearings. And finally, no comments or concerns were received from utility agencies or other city departments. Uh, again, we'll evaluate uh, compliance with the comprehensive plan. Uh, 44th Avenue is denoted by the, the green, or the, excuse me, the pink dashed line, which indicates a neighborhood commercial corridor. Uh, the comprehensive plan calls for these corridors to have a broad mix of activities, including small scale, pedestrian friendly, mixed use retail, commercial, and residential uses. Uh, because the mixed use neighborhood zone district does allow for smaller scale commercial uses, residential uses, and of course a mix of those two, staff finds that the proposed MUN zoning is consistent with the policies and goals of the comprehensive plan. Um, staff concludes that the request does meet the zone change criteria. It is supported by the comprehensive plan and it is compatible with the surrounding area, which already includes a mix of uses. For these reasons, staff does recommend approval. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any specific questions that you have. Um, the applicant is present and will not be making a presentation, but is available to answer any questions that are better suited for them. Thank you. Um, I have one person signed up to speak, uh, Robert um, Petrikas. Do you wish to speak? Okay. He's. Thank you so much. Um, 
Okay, I will open this up for questions from council of the um, staff or the applicant. Before I close the public hearing, are there any other questions of the staff or applicant? I'm going to close the public hearing and Mr. Urban, a motion is in order. Let's see. I move to uh, recommend, a, let's see, is that the right? No, sorry. Thank you. I move to approve council bill number 20-2018 an ordinance approving the rezoning of property located at 6701 West 44th Avenue from commercial one to mixed use neighborhood MUN on second reading and that it take effect 15 days after final publication for the following reasons. City Council has conducted a proper public hearing that meets all public notice requirements as required by section 26-109 of the Code of Laws. The request to rezoning has been reviewed by the Planning Commission, which has forwarded its recommendation for, uh, of approval. The request to rezoning has been found to comply with the criteria for review in section 26-112.E of the Code of Laws. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, I will entertain discussion on the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Will the clerk please poll the council? Um, the motion carries six to one with council member Matthews voting no. Thank you. Um, we will. Uh, just earned. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Fitzgerald to introduce item number five. Ms. Hoppy is not here. Okay, very good. Uh, Council Bill number 21 2018 and an ordinance adopting a new section 2 9 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws concerning the retention of interest earned on escrow accounts held by the city at issue. The city treasurer, Mr. DeTulio, has determined that there is a significant cost associated with, with city staff receiving and administrating monies deposited into multiple escrow accounts for various purposes mandated by the code of laws. Exact accounting and record keeping of each small escrow account and interest earned thereon would be extremely burdensome and impractical for the city staff to reasonably achieve. The code amendment will allow the city to retain interest on such escrow accounts. Treasurer Dutulio has reviewed the ordinance and supports the code change. Additionally, the treasurer also recommends that all future escrow documents clearly state that the escrow funds are not paid interest. Thank you. Um, this is an ordinance on second reading. It is a um, public hearing. It is not quasi-judicial. Do we have an ordinance number on this? Madam, uh, Mr. Mayor, this ordinance will be um, number 1652. Thank you very much. I'm going to open the public hearing. And uh, Mr. Goff, do we have a staff presentation on this? Our city treasurer, Mr. DeTulio, will give a short presentation. Mr. DeTulio, please continue. Uh, thank you. The comments that were read by Mr. Fitzgerald were complete. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add to this is I passed out uh, to you on the dais is the um, total funds report. It's on your, right, should be right near your computer or your mic. What I've added to this is other funds. And so if you look down to other funds, we have a public works escrow fund that currently has $622,000 and some change. That uh, money is held in our bank and I haven't moved that to a higher interest bearing account yet because this is where a lot of the majority of the escrow funds are stored. So that $622,000 is made up of many, many different uh, projects. And so to keep track of all the interest for all those different projects and then to rebate those was the issue that I brought up to you of, about a month ago, a month and a half ago. So that's why the ordinance came forward. So if you have any questions, I'd be willing to answer them. Thank you. Um, do we have um, questions from council of uh, staff? Uh, I had one, Mr. DiTulio. Now, uh, the, um, the interest bearing accounts that these are in, they have uh, various liquidity indexes to them? No, this money is at the bank and this is a money market, which is 
liquid all the time. Okay. So this money is coming and going as projects complete and, and the projects are completed. If this ordinance passes tonight, I'm going to move this fund, the $622,000, to the CSAFE money market account, which is paying a lot more interest than this at the, the bank. And it would have the appropriate liquidity in order to refund right. these uh, these uh, holdings back to the appropriate parties. Correct. As, as we have CDs mature and we have these funds in, they're all money market liquid accounts. So that all of this is, as the CDs mature, we're moving them into liquid accounts so that we can earn more interest and actually have access to those funds. The council could access them and the staff when we need to. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of staff? Uh, I'm going to close the public hearing and a motion is in order. Mr. Fitzgerald. I move to approve Council Bill Number 21-2018, an ordinance adopting a new Section 2-9 of the Whitney Ridge Code of Laws concerning the retention of interest earned on escrow accounts held by the city on second reading and that it take effect 15 days after final publication. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? <clears throat> motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. We will move to item number six on the agenda. Mr. Matthews, would you please introduce item number six? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> item number six is council bill number 23-2018 an ordinance vacating any interest held by the city of Wheat Ridge in a portion of Miller Street, a public roadway adjacent to 5185 Miller Street, case number WV-18-01, Roche Industries. At issue, the applicant is requesting approval of a right-of-way vacation for a remnant section of right-of-way formerly used uh, for Miller Street. The right-of-way section requested for vacation was abandoned as a thoroughfare in the early 2000s when Miller Street was rerouted to the east. This is an ordinance on first reading. Thank you. Um, and this is to set a, um, uh, a second reading date, so a motion is in order. Would you please provide us a motion? I move to approve Council Bill Number 23-2018, an ordinance vacating any interest held by the City of Wheat Ridge in a portion of Miller Street, a public roadway adjacent to 5185 Miller Street on first reading for the sole purpose of ordering it published and for a public hearing set for Monday, September 10th, 2018 at 7 p.m. in City Council Chambers and, if adopted, that it take effect 15 days after final publication. Second. Period. <laughs> Second by Mr. Urban. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Please poll the council. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rann, would you please introduce item number seven? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Bill Number 24-2018, an ordinance extinguishing any rights or interest held by the city in a slope easement, PE-55A, associated with Taft Court, a public roadway. At issue, the City of Wheat Ridge holds in trust for the public a slope easement designated PE-55A easement along the easterly side of Taft Court for the purpose of maintaining a roadway embankment. The landowner owner wishes to develop the area of land lying east of Taft Court that includes the embankment currently encumbered by the easement. To, to allow development of the land, the easement must be extinguished. Thank you. This is an ordinance on first reading to set the time and location for a second reading. Um, an ordinance or a, a motion would be in order. Ms. Duran. I move to approve Council Bill Number 24-2018, an ordinance extinguishing any rights or interests held by the city in a slope easement PE-55A associated with Taft Court on first reading. Order it publish. Public hearing set for Monday, August 27, 2018 at 7 p.m. in City Council Chambers and that it take effect 15 days after final publication. Second. Motion by Mr. Rand. Second by Mr. Urban, is there discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please poll the council? 
Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pond, would you please introduce item number eight? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Bill number 25-2018, an ordinance vacating any interest held by the city in a portion of Ridge Road, a public roadway. City of Wheatridge holds rightways for trust public land. The roadway um, acquired by the Regional Transportation District is successfully wived just west of Tabor Street. Current street standards can be met with a narrow right of way. A strip of right of way approximately 20 feet in width along the north side of Ridge Road between Tabor Street and Taft Court is, has been deemed to be excessive and unnecessary by public re works. Is a motion in order? This is an ordinance on first reading to set the date and location for a, a second hearing. On uh, a public hearing, would you please uh, provide us a motion? Thank you. I move to approve Council Bill Number 25-2018, an ordinance vacating any interest held by the city in a portion of Ridge Road on first reading order at published public hearing set for Monday, August 27, 2018 at 7 p.m. in City Council Chambers, and that it take effect 15 days after final publication. Second. second. We have a, uh, a motion and a second by Ms. Dozman. Would the clerk please poll the council? <clears throat> Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Ms. Davis, would you please introduce item number nine? Thank you. Resolution 48-2018, a resolution approving the consolidated service plan for the Yarrow Gardens Metropolitan District. The issue the City Council has asked to approve the service plan for the Yarrow Gardens Metropolitan District, a taxing district to be used to finance certain improvements for the residential development Service plan approval is the means by which the city oversees the creation of such districts which are ultimately approved for formation by the district court. Um, prior action, the council received a presentation by the project developer at a study session during which the developer described the purposes for creation of that district. And it looks like maybe perhaps tonight we'll be getting a summary of that. Is that what this is? Right Thank here? you. Um Mr. Goff, do we have a, a report or presentation? We on do. Um, the applicant is here. Um, Jay Garcia from Thri Thrive Home Builders um, is going to uh, provide a presentation first, and then Kristen Bear with WBA, um, who you saw at a, a previous study session, um, is representing the Metropolitan District. We'll also give a, a quick <coughs> presentation on the parameters of the Metropolitan District. So, Jay, um, if you want to start, uh, presentation's up and ready to go. Okay, Mr. Garcia, if you'd please uh, introduce yourself and uh, um, spell your last name and give us an address and, and proceed. Uh, Jay Garcia, uh, G-A-R-C-I-A. I reside in 2020 Lawrence, uh, Denver, um, and our office is a block away. That's on 1875 Lawrence Street. Um, I'm here this evening, as indicated, to just kind of provide some context and background on who Thrive Home Builders is. Um, you all may remember me from uh, the city council hearing back in June received approval for this project uh, but city manager Goff thought that it would be a good idea to just uh, kind of give you some background and context and um, help some of you remember uh, from the past uh, that we have worked in the city before although under a different name and I'll get to that here. please, please speak, speak into the microphone so we can oh, we cap, capture all of this thank you quiet um, so I thought I'd start just by talking about uh, a little bit of Thrive's approach to home building. And our uh, three legs of the stool, so to speak, are efficient, healthy, and local, as you can see here on your screen. Uh, we really pride ourselves in being innovators in efficient design, uh, both in zero energy ready homes, but lead for homes and Ener Energy Star as well. Um, we've helped to develop and enhance certain programs for clean indoor air quality, water quality and efficiency, and just um, you know, help to promote healthier building materials as well. And we're local. Uh, we live here. We're from here. Uh, the company started here over 26 years ago now, and uh, we pride ourselves on that as well. So this is a long list of awards and recognition, and I don't expect you to read them all. Um, and I, I'm not putting this up here to brag or, or to impress you. It's just m mostly to show you that you know, while a lot of builders will, will say that they're a good home builder and maybe maybe even have some, some local recognition, we have that local recognition. We have the, you know, the state of Colorado, the local Denver chapter, um, but we also have national programs recognizing us, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, 
uh, the EPA, um, you know, the U.S. Green Home Builders Association. Um, and so we think that that's important because, you know, anybody can say that they're good, but that third party sort of recognition and acknowledgement shows that other people can acknowledge, you know, the small local Colorado home builder. So more recently, um, every year since its inception back in 2013, we've actually won the grand award for innovation in housing from the U.S. Department of Energy. And uh, this last year, 2017, we entered in two categories and won both of those. So we're proud of that. Uh, and then an award that um, our CEO is probably tired of hearing us talk about, but is a really big deal, is the Builder of the Year for the entire nation. And I think I may have mentioned this um, back when I presented back in, uh, in June, but this is the cover of that magazine that, that shows our CEO and founder, Gene Myers. So we're very proud of that as well, because it's not something we applied for. It's just that uh, the National Association acknowledged us and who we are. So I wanted to put this up here. Um, the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is the Perrins Row Project, which I'll speak more about here in a moment. But I wanted to, again, kind of uh, explain to you all that it's important to us as a builder and, and a member of the community to offer, you know, the benefits of what our homes do. It's, uh, you know, doing more with building. It's providing energy efficiency, sustainable power and energy, healthy homes and cleaner air, and doing all that with what we've really refined throughout the years as, as what we call the science of building. And what we really offer to the community as a whole, as part of these communities that, that we've built before, uh, including Perrins Row, is sustainability, high design, urban density, but also that walkability that really are kind of integral to a, a good urban neighborhood. And why we believe that uh, the city of Wheat Ridge is aligned with our values and we're aligned with yours is because, you know, we've seen throughout, um, you know, our experience here and also you know, just through local publications and your website as well, the commitment to environmental stewardship, uh, healthy living with your residents through di various different programs, and also innovation. So we think that those are directly aligned with everything that, uh, that we're about. Um, so a past project in, uh, in Wheat Ridge is at 38th and Depew. It was uh, part of the overall um, 38th Avenue uh, improvement process but it really if you're driving down 38th that we're very proud of this this product and we think it was extremely successful is 26 townhome units um, on 1.2 acres and this Yarrow Gardens project is kind of the, the evolution of that same product type slightly larger a little bit more enhanced but you know essentially the same sort of urban character that we would be looking to provide so this was um, back in 2014 this was the groundbreaking when we were formerly known as New Town Builders. And I mentioned that, uh, you know, we've really gained a lot of national, um, you know, sort of acclaim and recognition. And it was, it was shortly after this time, a couple years later, that we ended up rebranding to become Thrive Home Builders. And through that rebranding process, we said, you know, New, new Town rebranded. Uh, it's still the same owners. We are still the same company. We have the same values. We just thought that um, that would kind of speak more to the, the local brand that we had been working on establishing nationally. But, uh, you know, this, this also speaks to the fact that we were very excited at the time to be a part of the Wheat Ridge community and we remain excited. Um, we think that that was a successful project and I'm sure that um, if, if warranted or if uh, wanted, we could schedule another groundbreaking with this council as well. Um, so that project ended up winning two awards back in 2015. You can see this aerial shot kind of in the bottom right hand corner showing the, the solar panels. We would look to do that with this current project as, as well. But we won um, the actual grand award as well as just the sort of nominating award that gets you invited to the party. Uh, so that, that's every <coughs> October they have a ceremony. And uh, for this project we were um, nominated and or we, we submitted and won the, the actual award but then we won the grand where there's only one in the nation that they offer for that multifamily category. So again, looking to do more of the same for this community. And I would uh, put up here on the screen for you to review the, the various aspects, the recognition, the, the stamps, the certifications that we can receive um, with what we do. Uh, EPA Energy Star for Homes label, 
that's that's what a lot of people kind of say is their you know their green home building that's their brand but that's kind of like where we begin um, we take it a little bit further with the EPA Indoor Plus qualified home label. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy Net Zero uh, Energy Ready certification. So the, all these homes will meet that bare minimum. And then also receive uh, LEED certification for homes. So that's something that we've worked with all these different programs to kind of adapt and, and make uh, their programs more efficient and successful throughout the various locations. Um, so as far as how we achieve this, our standard building practices are super insulated walls. We typically do this with a, a du double two by four wall that's staggered on center, and then we blow a whole bunch of insulation into that. But we're constantly looking to evolve. So with this particular product type, we might look at an advanced framing system that would allow for a little bit more room on the inside. But this is how we would typically do it, and we would only seek to improve upon that building practice. Uh, we do things like tankless hot water he heaters with learning recirculating pumps. The, the pumps themselves actually begin to learn your, your various habits and try to have uh, hot water on demand uh, at the right times and locations. Um, we have high performance carrier efficient gas furnaces that we install. Low E double glaze windows, U value of 0.3 or less. Roof orientations uh, throughout our projects which uh, improve and enhance energy uh, generation from solar panels and then 100% LED lighting. So just a list of the, some of the things that we'd be planning to do um, for this community and based on that information and just the building envelope that we've designed, the various uh, window orientations and, and how the homes sit on the site, these are all very pr approximate and preliminary but we we take it seriously to kind of model these these different homes and we're looking at a home energy rating score which is you know the lower the better um, in the low 30s for these, um, or potentially less. I mean, that's just what the preliminary um, studies are showing. And we will definitely run these homes through those different models once they have been built. Um, over 20% reduction in energy usage just versus the 2015 International Energy Construction Code. And then a negative CO2 emissions when we have solar. We do have plans to install solar on these roofs, um, and that would enhance the actual generation of energy and, and actually result in a negative CO2 emissions. And then just based on an existing U.S. home um, that meets code, we would see over $700 a year in energy savings and average monthly heating and cooling costs of less than $15. This could be far less. It could be actually half of that, but, you know, with these preliminary models, that's what we can commit to. So this is a, a graphic that we, we put up just to kind of show the home energy rating score. Um, 100 is what a typical new home built to code would score. This is an Energy Star home. You remember I, I referred to that earlier as kind of what people um, associate with green building. And then these are just the, the zero energy ready homes without solar and what they're scoring in the low 30s. So here are some internal images just to kind of show you that we don't simply, you know, focus on the, the core of the building or the, you know, the very high-end um, uh, HVAC systems. We, we do focus on, on providing a very livable and, and welcoming and open floor plan with our units. And um, just a few other images from the interiors. And that is what I have for you today. Thank you very much. everybody. Nice to see you again. Kristen Baer with the law firm of White Bear, Inkley, uh, Waldron and Tanaka. Address is 2154 East Commons Avenue, Suite 2000, Centennial 80112. So I'm going to be pretty quick because you've gone over this at study session, but I wanted to go over some of the higher points of the service plan. Uh, and again, I'm going to make it very abbreviated so that we can get to any questions you might have relative to this district specifically or districts in general in Colorado. 
So the overall authorization and purpose, again, we are providing for a service plan that gives authorization to this district as is provided in Title 32. The restrictions that we've discussed are primarily financial in nature. This district will have the authorization not only to finance the public infrastructure, construct the same, but also to provide operation and maintenance to the residents and property owners that purchase homes in the future, as well as provide covenant control and architectural types of enforcement that you would normally otherwise see with an HOA. In terms of the revenues that can be generated by this district, it'll be comprised of property taxes that are imposed on an annual basis by the district board of directors as they go through that budget process, very much akin to what you do as a council on an annual basis. We will also have specific ownership taxes that are available to the district. And again, these are automobile registration taxes that are allocated as to all of the um, governmental entities that impose mill levies in the state. We get an allocation of that. And then fees and charges would be imposed by the district for purposes of certain operation and maintenance expenses. In terms of the financial authorization, again, what we've proposed in the service plan is a maximum debt authorization of $6 million. That would be funded by a maximum mill levy of 60 mills um, until the debt is below 50% total debt to assessed. At that time, that mill levy cap would fall away. That is a statutory type of um, cap limit, and it falls away under statute based upon the legislature's determination that at 50% debt to assessed, that's a relatively safe threshold for the district to go unlimited. Again, that mill levy will adjust as the state adjusts its residential assessment ratio. So right now we're at 7.2%. The legislature makes that determination uh, uh, every other year. The maximum debt mill levy imposition term is 40 years. So the district would have the ability to levy that debt mill levy cap for a period not to exceed 40 years. At that point in time, those residents could determine to come back to you for some further authorization as part of a service plan amendment. The financing plan that's attached to the service plan shows the debt that's anticipated to be issued by the district. So again, we have a 60 mil levy cap, but we are estimating that the mill levy that's necessary to service the debt in that financing plan is a little bit less than that at 55.277 mills. We're anticipating two separate series of debt to be issued by the district. One would be in 2018 for a total of about $3.5 million. Out of that $3.5 million, there would be construction funds of a little over $2.5 million that would be dropped into a construction fund and the district would use that as an ongoing basis to either construct the improvements through the district itself or to reimburse the developer, just depending on timing and uh, funds that might be available based on timing. There's a series 2028 bond that is also anticipated with a par amount of 5.5 million. That's a little bit different in that as part of that series of bonds, we would be refunding the bond issue that would be issued in 2018 and raising some new money to the extent there were additional public improvements that needed to be reimbursed to the developer or put in at that time. In terms of the operation authorization, we do not have a cap, a mill levy cap, relative to operation and maintenance types of services that will be provided to the district. The district will be providing the same types of services that an HOA would otherwise provide. And so the homeowner is really not going to see a difference in terms of the services that will be provided by the district versus an HOA other than it will be a single entity that provides the service. So there will be some cost savings associated with that because we won't have duplicative types of administrative services and it will be a more streamlined point of contact for that homeowner. So again, the district is going to replace the HOA. We are anticipating about eight mills as part of the financing plan that's attached to the service plan. But again, as part of the district budgeting process on an annual basis, that's gonna be determined by the board of directors in terms of what property tax is gonna be imposed 
for operation maintenance services and any additional fees and charges that might be necessary for the district at that point. So the district is going to be run by an elected board of property owners and residents as development progresses and they will be making those determinations on an ongoing basis as this, this community develops. So the property tax calculation, this is a little bit different than I showed you before because I have put the mill levy that you see here at the 55.277 showing exactly what that resident might be expected to pay towards the district for debt, which is uh, $1,790. At the study session I had it just ramped up to 60. And that is based upon the 7.2% residential assessment ratio that's in place in Colorado right now. So the next steps, assuming that we can get the service plan approved by you tonight, which we are, of course, requesting, we would be filing a petition to the district court in Jefferson County for purposes of requesting that they allow us to hold an election on this matter. That election would be held on November 6th. We would be asking those electors to organize the district, elect the initial board of directors, and to authorize tax and debt of the district as is permitted in the service plan. Assuming that election passes, we go back to the district court, file the documentation with respect to the election itself, and the district court would issue an order for the organization of the district. At the point at which that's actually recorded on the property, the district becomes legally effective uh, for all purposes. So again, I know I've gone through this very quickly and would be happy to answer any questions you might have about the service. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions from Council? Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is for the City Attorney. Uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, this service plan, wh where does our Chapter 13 of our charter come to play as it relates to the creation of improvement in special districts? And uh, I understand there's a petition relative to the District Court, but is there not also a petition that is required to the City Council in the same manner well let me look um, and we we did look at this and the chapter 13 relates to improvement districts and and I reviewed that and came to the conclusion that that you're not creating an improvement district uh, in pursuant to the various statutes that allow the city, allow local governments to create improvement districts, for example, for sidewalk improvements where uh, you get a petition from landowners in the district saying, hi, we'd like you to create a district and run that district, uh, you know, impose the fees, collect the money, build the sidewalks for us, like a special improvement district. It's a metro district. So in my opinion, it falls outside of the necessity in Chapter 13 of the Charter to, for, for there to be a petition for an ordinance to create it. Instead, we go to Title 32 of the statutes, which allows the, the city, or the city's role is pretty limited to approving or disapproving the service plan. And then the petitioners have to go on to district court to get the district created. I guess uh, in Chapter 13 here, it says, creation of special or local improvement districts. Those are two distinct entities, and Title 32 defines a metro district as a special district. So uh, that's where I'm confused as it relates to that chapter. I, I understand. I, I've, I, the, the, the structure of that chapter, in my opinion, is, is separate from the, the metro district creation process in Title 32. And, and it's my opinion that Chapter 13 of the Charter doesn't, doesn't sort of layer on another uh, city process onto the Title 32 Metropolitan District creation process. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess my other questions are rela uh, related to the limitations that are described. And it seems like there's a, a few limitations that are not a part of this service plan. And, um, specifically uh, limiting the monies from other government sources. It doesn't appear as though they're seeking money from other government sources, but in other service plans there's been that limitation that they're not to <coughs> seek or apply for grants or uh, monies from trusts or other sources. And so how does that play in here as it relates to the service plan? 
Well, uh, your role under the statute is clearly to approve the service plan with or without conditions. And, and while I have reviewed the service plan as against the statute, uh, that I haven't done any kind of, um, what's the right word, qualitative review, simply, you know, does it comply with the, the minimum requirements of the statute, which I believe it does, you have the right to, to grant or withhold your, your approval of the service plan or to approve it with conditions or to continue the hearing, or this isn't hearing, continue the matter and suggest that, you know, conditions be added to the service plan and that can easily be one of them. Okay, and I, so I guess uh, because this is something that we've done, uh, we haven't really done this type of uh, service plan in Metropolitan District for this type of setup in the past. I, I'm just somewhat concerned about some of the limitations that aren't in the service plan as it, as it stands. And I guess two specifically is that I don't want us to have this Metro District tapping other resources in addition to the, to the mill levy and whatnot. And I also am concerned about any kind of uh, property acquisition rights that the Metro District might have and limiting those property acquisition uh, uh, rights of the Metro District. So th those would be my two concerns that as it relates to this. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Additional uh, Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also I have some questions too, and I'm glad Zach mentioned that. So I'll I'll go to section seven here on dissolution. I've worked around metro districts for a long time, and some have been very good, and some of them have been very abusive. As a contractor, I did work for both. Um, metro districts tend to be like a bad cold. They never seem to go away. And so I would like for you to discuss a little bit about the dissolution of this metro district. And um, since we are not a full service city, how are you coordinating um, turning these facilities over to different utility districts and streets and roads to the city and what have you. Ms. Mayor? So relative to the first question on dissolution, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, dissolution, this district, because it's going to really be taking the place of an HOA, those homeowners and residents are going to operate this district in perpetuity for purposes of providing those services. Now, if for some reason those homeowners in the future decide to create an HOA that binds all of the property through a declaration, the district could actually be dissolved and those operations, uh, covenant control, architectural control, could be conveyed relative to an HOA taking on those services. But as it's constructed and structured in the service plan at this point, we don't anticipate that to happen. Um, what was your second question? Well, let's, let's drop into utilities, water, sewer. Okay. I mean, are you, obviously you guys aren't going to build a sewage treatment plant out there or a water treatment plant, so you're going to buy water from somebody. Normally, those facilities get handed over to whoever you're buying the water from at some point in time, so, and then they maintain and what have you. Does that happen, or are you planning on just keeping guys around to fix your water mains forever. Construction of all of the public improvements has to be done in accordance with the underlying jurisdiction's requirements, and that includes any requirements relative to dedication and conveyance. So whatever the requirements of the city are, for instance, on the streets, we would be required to construct all of those improvements and go through your standard acceptance process. Mm. The district does not supplant or override any of the internal rules and regulations you have in terms of either development or construction of those public improvements, nor does it have any impact on other governing jurisdictions on those items. Okay, so at some point in time, if you've turned the water over to Wheat Ridge Water, for example, and the sewer over to Westridge and, what, and streets to the city, what, uh, the, the idea of this is for public improvements. What then public improvements is the Metro District, you say it's going to be in perpetuity. What public improvements are they going to oversee? There will be some landscaping that is part of park areas that is not turned over to the city. There will be some sidewalks. There will be, again, the architectural and covenant control that the district continues to, to operate. Why? Who's, 
I'm really concerned about that. Like I said, that metro districts, I've seen many of them historically that just hang on and then somebody makes a lot of money off of them. And so are board members going to be strictly volunteers? Is there going to be paid help? Who's going to pay the accountants? I mean, I've run into that problem with HOAs, but it, at least no one was getting a salary. What, who's going to be, are there going to be salaried positions on this district? So we don't anticipate there, there would be the need for any employees at all. This district would have consultants that advise the district board as to accounting, legal. Uh, the district board would be required to get an independent audit on an annual basis. Board members in terms of a district are limited by statute as to anything they get paid, which is not a whole heck of a lot. It's about $100 a meeting. So th there would not be any money that board members are making as a profit. Rather, for purposes of financing, what we're proposing as part of the service plan is that the public improvements themselves be financed. And that is limited by state statute. So we can only finance certain categories of public improvements, and they have to be for the public benefit, for the community that's actually going to be um, out there, the residents and property owners. Why would you not just simply make um a um, mechanism in here to when the public improvements, the initial construction of public improvements is done to morph this over into an HOA if the, if the residents so wish to have one. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and what happens to the mill levy? Is, is the HOA going to, is, is this quasi HOA slash Metro District going to continue to charge mill levies or is it going to go to annual fees? Um, I mean, whenever you have an organization like that, it's going to chew up money even if it's to pay consultants. So again, this district is authorized to impose mill levies for both purposes of debt, so the debt that it's proposing to issue, as well as for operation and maintenance. We're anticipating eight mills that are shown in that, in that financing plan. Uh, there is not a limit on the operational mill levy, but it has to be imposed in accordance with the budget. There is a benefit to property owners to the extent that they're paying property taxes versus fees and charges. And so we want to carefully balance that, but the service plan does allow for the property taxes to be imposed by the district, whereas an HOA would not be authorized to do that. An HOA can only impose the fees and charges to it. Okay, but 20 years from now, 30 years from now, construction is paid for, you're in maintenance mode, are you going to require still require eight mills? How do, how do we kind of build some protection in for people who buy these homes that the district will be reasonable in um, not setting up a cash cow, if you will. They've got 8%, everyone's used to paying 8%, and all of a sudden they end up with a million dollars in the bank, and we're not sure why. Yeah, the, the improvements that the district is going to operate and maintain in the future are not substantial. So every year that district board, and eventually that district board will be residents and property owners that live out there, will make a determination of the operation and maintenance needed for those facilities, along with any kind of administrative costs that are associated with consultants and or covenant control and architectural control. And they will make that budget. They will impose a mill levy that's equal to the expenditures that it anticipates plus any fees and charges. So they're, they're going to be very cognizant of the balance on a going forward basis based upon the budget. Okay, but then how does Tabor fall in the line with that? I mean, let's just say you're at 8% right now. Tabor probably doesn't fall in the line if you drop your mill levy to 3% and charge less taxes. But when you want to go back to 4% or, you know, let's just... If you, if you feel like if you're not meeting your budget at what you consider your budget of needs and you have to go up to 4%, you have to do a special Tabor election then. And what's that cost in, in implication? So, so as part of the original organizational election, 
we will authorize the district for purposes of TABOR. So it will have authorization for taxing, for spending, for retaining revenues, as well as the debt that's going to be authorized under the service plan. So that election will occur as part of that organizational process. If in the future, 40 years down the road, those homeowners want to build a pool in the middle of the neighborhood and no longer have TABOR authorization, they will have to go back to the voters and vote for further TABOR authorization if they want to issue more debt. Um, but, but we get the initial authorization up That's what I'm saying, but once you go back, if, if, if once you pay off your construction costs, maintenance hopefully will be less, and you drop your mill levy to three, do you need to go to back to Tabor to go up to four? No, we will not need to do that because we will get that initial authorization as part of that organizational election. Hmm. Um, I'll Thank you. Deal the floor right now. Okay, let's uh, see if any well, other think about this. <laughs> yeah, counselors have any uh, any further questions, Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as it relates to the service plan amendments, uh, in reading through it, it indicates that the city may uh, approve those, but um, why does it not say that the city shall approve those, or what's the process for that amendment? And, does the city approve that or not? So material modifications of the service plan have to come back to the city for purposes of approval. It would be through a, a similar process that we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if the district needed to or wanted to increase that debt service mill levy from 60 to 70, those, that board of directors would have to come before the council again and make the case for that based upon an updated financing plan and updated service plan provisions. Okay, thank you. And then uh, my last question is uh, for the city attorney. Um, so are we are both approving a, a service plan here as well as an IGA. And how are, we, how are we entering into an IGA with an entity that currently doesn't exist? Uh, and I appreciate your asking that question, actually. I was just talking with the city manager about sort of the, the, uh, the timing of that. The service plan does say the city council shall approve the intergovernmental agreement that's attached as Exhibit E uh, at the hearing or at the time of the uh, service plan approval. What I would suggest, there's sort of two options here, what I would suggest is we can add to the, to the motion that's in the packet right now approves the resolution uh, approving the, the service plan and in connection there with the intergovernmental agreement attached to Exhibit E, conditioned upon the district court approving the formation of the proposed district. That way, the, the, if the, in the event the district court, you, you approve the service plan, but in the event the district court doesn't approve the creation of the district, then the, the mayor and the city clerk and myself won't be authorized to sign the uh, intergovernmental agreement. And I guess as it relates to the, at what point in the process is the approved development plan signed off and is it the district court that signs off on that or are we the ones signing off on that? The service plan? Not the service plan. The, the, I understand there's a development plan that follows after the service plan. Am I? We're talking about the development of the, the land use? Sorry. Not necessarily land use, okay. but I understand the Metro District also has a development plan as well. I, I could be wrong. I'd like to have them address that all we're looking at tonight for us is service plan yeah, no, not as part of the service plan or organizational process right. there's not a separate development plan that the district goes through rather the developer entity goes through all of the development approvals necessary for mm -hmm. purposes of the residential development as part of your standard process okay thank you thank uh miss davis um so i have just a couple comments so um I mean, this is, again, a new um, kind of model that we're not used to here in Wheat Ridge as far as with this mill levy being attached to homes, this as such, uh, this, at least in my time. Um, so 
I'm glad to see that you're disclosing it with the agreements when you're selling the homes, which is something that's not always there. So I'm glad to see that, and I appreciate that. Although, doing a little homework um, with some realtors and talking to a few people, it is not uncommon. So that makes me feel a little bit uh, better. Uh, but it is always not common that it's disclosed, so I thank you. Um, and, and didn't know it was Newtown, which makes me happy because I think um, we've had good relationships with Newtown before and um, with Jean, so that's good too. Um, I, and so I, I do think um, that's, that's a, a good relationship we've had in the past. Um, it, it's going to be interesting, this site. Um, as people know, it's in my district and in my neighborhood. I, I, I still worry, and, and again, that's not what we're talking about today, but um, it's, it's a lot of townhomes here, and I'm going to just say this to Patrick, and for Patrick to talk to the team, I still worry about traffic and, and um, the streets around this area, and I know Newtown will be respectful of it. I um, live in this neighborhood, and I know these streets, and I still think it needs attention. And I'm gonna say it again, um, because it's gonna need attention, and, and it's aside from this, but um, I think it's gonna need the attention. Uh, but um, it's gonna be an interesting development, so thank you. Mr. Matthews, I'll let you continue, but we've, you've, you've had quite a bit of time on this already, so. And thank you. Uh, just briefly, I, I wish to clarify that I'm not doubting the integrity of anybody that's currently in the room. Whenever proposals like this come before me, and that includes zoning changes and a lot of other things, I try to look 20 years, 40 years down the road. I'm going to assume you folks probably won't even be involved with the project anymore. And I try and figure out, you know, what these decisions can morph into, what unintended consequences can be down the road. So I would like to point that out. If it sounds like I'm um, doubting your, your integrity, I'm not. That's why I asked this. <coughs> Excuse me. My last question is, there's a section here that says, and I quote, upon an independent determination of the city council that the purposes for which the district was created have been accomplished, the district agrees to file a petition in the appropriate district court for dissolution. And it says, of course, all debts must be paid ad nauseum. Um, how does, how does, do we have any annual review on that or is it just up to we wait and see if maybe I mean, and I'm thinking 20 years down the road 30 citizens start to complain um, and a how absolute is this if the city council says you must dissolve are, are they is that really in kind of an I don't think there's anything ironclad legally in anything, any contract anymore, but how much weight does this paragraph carry where the elected officials can still look after their constituents? Fair enough. A couple of things I'd like uh, um, Ms. Beer to address the sort of the process for dissolution and how that is triggered and how that can be triggered by the city. Uh, but uh, part of your question was, well, do you hear about this district? Ever. Are there any kind of annual reports? And there are. There's an annual report required at uh, Section 6 of, the, of the, um, um, the, the service plan. And I've seen those in other districts for other cities that, that, that I represent. And, and uh, that's information that, that is important to cities, that they get an annual report of what's going on in the districts that they approve the formation of. In terms of dissolution, it's been... I'm trying to think of the last district I saw it dissolved, but but uh, like you, they last a long time. So I've probably seen more created than I have seen dissolved. Uh, but Kristen, you might want to address the dissolution process and the council's uh, flexibility around that, which I think is the question. Yeah. Sure. So as part of the service plan, we have put in a dissolution provision. It is predicated on the debt being discharged, is predicated on the district not having operational kinds of obligations that it has to fulfill. 
to the extent that the district were to file an annual report with you all and you determined that the district was no longer necessary, you could call on the district board to initiate dissolution proceedings. It has to take place through an election process. So again, at that point in time, once the, once the debt is discharged, homeowners and residents will be the board of directors of this district and they will be the governing body. Um, you will have a fully built out community. And so it's really the residents at that time that will be making the determination of whether or not to dissolve as part of that election process. But you as the governing jurisdiction on a continued basis will have the authorization to tell the district you need to dissolve and initiate those proceedings. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I've supported your development through the beginning, but my main concern, I hope you understand, is that 20, 20 years down the road or somewhere that the council can, I hate separate taxing authorities, be it RTD or what have you. And that, that's my main concern here is just 20 years down the road, city council can look after their constituents. Thank you. Ms. Bear, you said uh, you used the words residents would have control of the district. Is that distinct from, from property owners within the... Within the uh... Uh, not necessarily. So eligible elector under statute is defined specifically for Title 32 districts. And any eligible elector is able to vote or participate as a board member. And that is by virtue of their underlying property ownership or their residency within the boundaries of a district. So you could have the occasion where a home is owned uh, by two, two people and they're leasing the home to somebody else. Uh, so you could have three or four separate voters, eligible electors on that property, all of whom are able to vote, all of whom are able to participate as board candidates in future elections. So it would be the, the, so you're voting your property rights in that election. You're, you're actually voting not based upon the, it's not one vote per property, it's one vote per eligible elector. So each property is going to have, you know, two to three electors. And tell me again, how do you become an eligible elector? You have to be registered to vote in the state of Colorado, and you have to either own property within the district or reside within the district. Okay, so there's, so it, in some instances, if you were a property owner but didn't reside in the district, you would have a vote and then your tenant would have a vote. You certainly would. As an eligible elector. There, there's another mechanism that's allowed, uh, and if you are, if you have a contract to purchase property, and you're obligated under that contract to pay property taxes on an ongoing basis, you are also an eligible elector under Title 32, as is your spouse. So there are a lot of different mechanisms under which eligible electors are qualified to both vote and be board members. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there any more discussion on this issue? We've spent quite a bit of time here. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Baer. Um, I would entertain a motion, Ms. Davis. I move to approve resolution number 48-2018, a resolution Approving the Consolidated Service Plan for the Yarrow Gardens Metropolitan District. And may, may I ask? Second. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, our, our attorney has another, uh, another. I apologize. In order to address the issue raised by Councilmember Urban about the uh, IGA that's attached to the service plan, I've got some language here that, that, that I'd, I'd like to suggest you add to the motion. Uh, right. with, with thanks to Councilmember Urban for... For, for raising it. That, this, the IGA or something like that? Yes, this council action form got put together while Mr. Goff was, was out and I was in charge of it, so it's on me to have not added this, so it's not on, not on him. If you would add to the end of the motion that's printed, and in connection therewith, the IGA attached as Exhibit E, conditioned on district court approval of the formation of the district. And I can I just, write yeah, that what out. He said? I can write that out and give it to the clerk. Could you, uh, do we have that in writing or? Um, I'll write it out and give it to the okay. clerk. Let's um, yeah, what he's mark saying. time just a couple of minutes here while our attorney. Uh, or if you like, I can read the motion and she can adopt it. And then I'll give it to the clerk. That, I, would, I would accept that, yes. Save us some time. The um, a proper motion, if uh, Councilmember Davis wishes to make it, would be to move to approve resolution number 48, 2018 
resolution approving a consolidated service plan for the Euro Gardens Metropolitan District and a connection therewith the IGA attached as Exhibit E conditioned upon district court approval of the formation of that district. Yes, I wish to adopt that. Second. second. Okay, I'm going to give that to Mr. Urban. So there is a motion and a second on the floor. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? The motion carries seven to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will go to item number 10, Mr. Fitzgerald. Okay, item number 10, resolution 49 2018. A resolution giving notice of and calling for a special municipal election to be held November 6, 2018 and submitting a ballot question authorizing the city to provide high-speed internet services. At issue, in 2005, the Colorado General Assembly enacted Senate Bill 05-152 which prohibits local governments such as the city of Wheat Ridge <clears throat> from providing cable television services, tele telecommunication services, and high-speed internet services, either directly or indirectly, unless services are authorized by the electorate. <clears throat> this resolution will submit the following language to the Wheat Ridge voters on November 6, 2018. Quote, shall the city of Wheat Ridge without increasing taxes by this measure and to restore local authority that was denied to local government by the Colorado General Assembly and foster a more competitive marketplace be authorized to provide high speed internet including improved high bandwidth services, telecommunication services and or cable television services to residents businesses, schools, libraries, nonprofit entities, and other users of such services, either directly or indirectly, with public or private sector partners, as expressly permitted by Article 27, Title 29 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. Thank you. Um, do you have a staff report or any, anything you all want to say on this matter? I don't. The only thing I'll, I will add is I removed um, the language that was um, agreed, to, agreed upon by council to remove at the study session, and I believe it was um, a phrase that said um, any, um, including new technologies, um, and so we did remove that language. And also just to remind um, uh, council and, and residents who may be listening that this doesn't compel the city to do anything. This just provides the, um, the city the option to um, enter into um, agreements in the future or provide these types of services, um, it, um, but does not require the city to actually do anything. Thank you. Is there um, discussion before we go to a motion? Any questions for staff? Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald? I don't have any questions of staff, but I just would like to say that uh, all of our neighbor cities have uh, passed a resolution similar to this, uh, minus Denver, which didn't. Um, and 92 cities and or counties in the state of Colorado have passed similar um, resolutions. This, this is simply a technicality that returns our rights to us. A motion is in order. I move to approve resolution number 49-2018, a resolution giving notice of and calling for a special municipal election to be held November 6, 2018, and submitting a ballot question authorizing the city to provide high-speed internet services. Second. We have a second and a, 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 a by Ms. Duran. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the agenda items on our business. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, this, um, well, I guess, uh, I, I guess there's another. Uh, Another one on here. Um, okay. 
Number 11. I guess I missed number 11. Okay. Um, Ms. Davis, would you... Um, or, okay, I won't go to Ms. Davis. Ms. Oh Ms. Uh, Dozman, would you please introduce item number 11? <laughs> resolution 50-2018, a resolution giving notice of and calling for a special municipal election to be held November 6, 2018, and submitting a ballot question authorizing the city to retain revenues in connection with 2016 ballot question 2E. At issue, uh, the city included a question on the November 2016 ballot to increase debt by up to $33 million and increase the city's sales and use tax rate by half a cent per dollar for uh, 12 years or when $38,500,000 is raised for the Investing for the Future infrastructure projects. The required Tabor election notice was provided to all voters, which provided, among other information, an estimate of $3,700,000 as the amount the tax increase would generate in 2017. The actual amount of new tax revenue uh, received by the city in 2017 was $4,157,931. <laughs> Which is four hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars and nine hundred thirty one or four hundred and fifty seven thousand nine hundred and thirty one dollars over the Tabor allowed amount. Consensus was reached by City Council to refer a question to the November 6, 2018 ballot, asking voters to allow the city to keep the excess revenue and temporary tax rate. Would you please read the ballot question? Would you like me to read that? Okay. Yes. Shall the city of Wheat Ridge be entitled to retain all revenues from the 2016 voter approved ballot question 2E, investing for the future half cent per dollar sales and use tax rate increase, and to continue to collect the tax at the half, per, half cent per dollar rate and expend said revenues, including any interest and investment income therefrom, until revenues from such tax increase reach 38.5 million or December 31st, 2028, whichever occurs first, in the following ways directed by the voters in 2016. Anderson Park Improvements, Wadsworth Boulevard Reconstruction through 35th Avenue to Interstate I-70, Wheat Ridge Ward Commuter Rail Station Area, Clear Creek Crossing Mixed Use Development Site on the west side of I-70 at 38th and Youngfield, without refunding any amount for exceeding the revenues estimate in the election notice mailed to voters in 2016. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goff, any, any further uh, comments uh, Just real this? briefly, um, we added the language that uh, was um, requested by Mr. Urban um, to make sure that the voters understood that this was still capped at $38.5 million or December 31st, 2028, whichever occurs first. Thank you. Any, uh, any discussion before we go to a motion? Uh, Ms. Dozman, would you give us a motion on this? Yes, sir. I move to approve resolution number 50-2018, a resolution giving notice of and calling for a special municipal election to be held November 6, 2018, and submitting a ballot question authorizing the city to retain revenues in connection with 2016 ballot question 2E. Second. Uh, there is a motion and a second by Mr. Urban. Now, discussion on the motion. Seeing none, will the clerk please poll the council? Motion carries seven to zero. Okay, well, I hope that takes care of our business portion of our meeting. I, my apologies. Um, so we will move to city manager's matters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think, as you all know, RTD has, has ramped up to multiple train service um, testing on the G line um, as of Sunday, August 3rd, I believe it was. Um, so RTD is hoping that um, they will be able to um, provide all of the uh, evidence that they need to in a 21-day period for the Federal Railroad Administration to sign off. Um, so keep your fingers crossed on that. Um, the, uh, you may be hearing train noises. Um, they still have to blow their horns. I think, I'm not sure if this is impacting Wheat Ridge residents that much, but um, mainly Arvada residents. So they are, they are, are getting some complaints in Arvada. But, just so our public understands, I, I do hear it at my house a little bit once in a while. Um, the train horns will still be blowing for quite some time until um, the quiet zones are approved um, by the um, RTD, actually approved by the Federal Railroad Administration and the PUC. Um, we have submitted the initial um, what's called notice of intent to um, apply for quiet zones back in 2015. Um, the next step is to apply for a notice of establishment of those quiet zones, and we cannot do that until we get um, permission from the FRA and the PUC to do that. Um, once once the um, NOE is 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 accepted, um, the FRA usually um, 
takes a 21 day period, another 21 day period to review that before any quiet zone um, is approved. So um, the horns will be blowing um, for some time still, um, but hopefully um, the quiet zone approvals will, will happen quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, city attorney's matters. Nothing to the, <clears throat> nothing tonight, thank you. Thank you very much. We will go to elected official matters and start with our clerk, Ms. Shaver. Okay, um, first of all, I, I, wanted, I wanted to say something ha um, happy. Good news first. Um, the festival was amazing. Um, Joe DeMott and Walt Pettit and Leah Dozeman, just hats off. And I know there's lots of other people that were involved and I don't even know who you are, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And the fireworks were absolutely amazing. They are taller than ever before because Saturday night we didn't go down and watch them. We were up on the hill at our house and usually we could just barely see the tall ones above the trees. These were like way up above the trees. And so I know they were higher than they've ever been before. Um, <clears throat> and then I wanted to, t something sad. Um, we, we've lost a fixture in our community. Um, if any of you know the waitress named Gail at Apparage Cafe, she passed away last Thursday. And she has worked at Apple Ridge for 28 years. Wow. And I just found out today, I didn't know, I didn't know her name. Just, she was just Gail. And Grandma, yeah. And other people called her Grandma. And she was sort of this tough and yet sweet lady from Texarkana, Texas. She had still had her Texarkana accent. And just a real nice woman and she could be tough when she had to and uh make things happen but um she was just just a delight and she's been around for so long and the folks at um there's not going to be a service but um uh on sunday the august 26th um they're tentatively that uh, they're planning um, kind of a little memorial event for her um, on Sunday afternoon after the um, restaurant closes for they usually close at two o'clock and um, at the time they said they're not too sure about that yet but I'm sure you can if you stop in there sometime you can find out but really gonna miss her it's it's kind of funny the not funny haha ha, funny but just the people that are in the community that are just part of your life and you really don't know a lot about them I mean but over the years we learned she was so proud of her grandchildren and and all, all like that and she'd had some health issues most recently but um they people like that cashiers and waitresses and bank tellers that you interact with for long periods of time and then all of a sudden they're gone and it and you don't know how to um you know get to their families or anything but um they'll, they'll be missed so gail was just she's just so great um she gave me two cookbooks once and she was very um uh, always talking about how at thanksgiving she would make seven up cakes and hummingbird cakes so it's just she's just a a good old southern cook and um just will miss her and i just wanted to share that with everybody well thank Please, you Ray. everybody thank you. has their gale memories i'm sure thank you for that uh, kind remembrance mr ann yes i do have one item a citizen was in earlier david allenberger who requested that we have a conversation maybe at a study session um considering a resolution signing on to um reauthorizing the funding for our land and water conservation so i would just like to request that we put that on a study session it's going to expire the end of september so if you could take a look and um, i think councilman urban will support me in that request we will uh, ask our uh, Mayor Pro Tem to get that on the schedule. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Urban. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, you're also known as the reserve champion for the 4-H uh, 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 celebrity live auction that was uh, yeah, held no, on no Sunday. <laughs> so uh, both uh, Mayor Sarker and I had a great time participating in the 4-H auction. Just want to say thank you again to the Clark family for inviting us and uh, teaching us to, how to show a pig, but I'm pretty sure the pig showed us. Um, but uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to visit with the 4-H students there and uh, also thank everybody that came out to the Carnation Festival and I, I, I too agree it was uh, one of the better shows and uh, really appreciated all the uh, work by the city staff and the police department and all their efforts. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Matthews. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not tonight. Ms. Dozman. Yeah, so I just want to reiterate uh, the many thanks that we have for the city for helping us put on the Carnation Festival. And I just wanted to kind of um, state some of the organizations that the Carnation Festival directly uh, contributes to. So we have the Rot Rotary Club and the Optimist Club serving beer, um, and they, they get a, a portion of those sales each year. The spaghetti dinner goes uh, to support the West Metro Fire Department, and the de uh, fire department actually uh, served the entire spaghetti dinner. Um, and Anthony DiGiulio cooked all of the food at Pietras. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of give them a shout out. And then Dominic had uh, mentioned the school benches, all of which went for over $150. Um, and they directly benefit each school that decorated them. And I just wanted to thank you all again, and I'm ready to gear up for the 50th, so I hope you are too. Thank you. Ms. Davis. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for the Carnation Festival. I think it's hard to name names because there's a ton of people. So I just want to thank everybody. And I was out there pouring beer, so it was fun. I saw you. I thought, thought we might need to card you to make sure you were old enough to sell. Thank you. Mr. Pond. Uh, thank you. I, I actually uh, want to just per personally thank and recognize Heather Geyer, who won the Trailblazer Award and, as mentioned, um, will be leaving leaving the city. Um, and and she made a comment um, in 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 her remarks about one, passing up some some different um, uh, forums like uh, DC perhaps to be closer to constituency and citizens and I just want to say that that she put that into action and, and in fact you know I was I was uh, a part of this uh, uh, citizen Academy Civic Academy that she ran and and I wouldn't be sitting here tonight if it wasn't for for her engagement and willingness to 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 sit down with 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 groups of people because I wasn't I wasn't I was just one person in one group so groups of people to engage us and to share her enthusiasm, knowledge uh, about about the city, and 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 really open open doors uh, to some of us who who felt uh, inspired to um, to to become active and, and to participate, which you know isn't always an easy thing, and 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 by all means, Heather made it made it much easier, and uh, I want to thank her for that. Thank you. And um, I will echo that and uh, thank, thank Heather for the service she's given our city and uh, wish her best in her new position. And uh, we look forward to working her with her uh, because we do a lot of uh, collective things in our, in our community. Um, I'd like to also echo uh, my thanks to the uh, 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 Carnation Festival. A lot of people participate in that. A lot of people work hard to put it on. It's a, it's a great time. And, uh, and it really shows that we have, a, we have really an extraordinary community. Uh, I'd like to thank the Clark family for uh, inviting us to, uh, to show their swine, which were uh, elegant animals and, uh, and really, a, really a learning experience for me. And they made us feel very welcome, and, uh, and that was a lot of fun. So thank you very much. It makes me, uh, makes me really happy to, to live in this community because of all the great people and, uh, and pigs that live here. So. With uh, any more uh, good of the order, we will uh, stand adjourned. Oh, one more, th one more thing.
Sorry, this just got passed out. Um, the Kiwanas of Wheat Ridge are having an open house networking event this Thursday, August 16th at 7 a.m. Uh, at Davies Chuck Wagon, uh, which is off of 26th Avenue here in Wheat Ridge. So I just want to put a plug in for that. The Kiwanas is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to improving the world one child and one community at a time. They do great things in this uh, community, and they were also at the Carnation Festival. So go in and support them. Another way to give back and, uh, and meet, meet some great people in your community. So with that, we will stand adjourned. Thank you.